So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, couples, or really technically it's the moment of a couple. But I'm writing it like this because people just call it a couple. Okay, and um, those are the those are the circular, like the just added on moments that if you've looked at the problems yet that I assigned or I shouldn't have assigned yet, sorry about that. Um, that those are show up in the problem like this, uh, you know, 10 Newton meters or whatever. Um, don't write that. We'll get to that. But so let me tell you, so we've talked about moments so far and a moment always depends on the about point and obviously it depends on the force. Um, a couple is a, a very uh, special kind of moment. So um, a couple is um, two equal and opposite forces acting at a distance. Um, and so I'm going to lay this out. So here's just the random object. Um, and uh, let's say one of these locations I'm going to call P1. And at the location P1, uh, we're going to say there's a force F acting. And this location I'm going to call P2. And at P2, there's a force acting in the other direction that we can write as the force vector negative F. Okay. I want you to notice, by the way, which one. So there are just two points with equal and opposite forces. Uh, which one we call F and which one we call negative F doesn't, you know, it, there's nothing to determine which one is which. You just call one F and one negative F. Um, and so what we're going to see is that um, the moment of a couple, every kind of moment depends on the about point, right? But if they appear as a couple, that dependence on the about point goes away. It does not depend on the about point. That's trippy. OK, and so because of that, you can think of it as just a pure couple. I, I'm sorry, a pure moment. It is a couple. And so uh, in numbers one and two in the homework, um, when it just showed the, the circular arrow, and had a number next to it, what that means is that that's the moment that this couple applies no matter what your about point is. It's the same no matter what the about point is. Okay, so I'm going to show you how that works mathematically. Uh, it just, um, and so, I'm going to just make an about point there. And what we're going to see is that when I go through the calculation of this total moment produced by these two things, when I, when I uh, calculate the moment produced by F, that A, the coordinates of A are going to be in it, obviously. Like, moments depend on A, right? When I calculate the moment produced by negative F, A is going to be in it. Those coordinates are going to matter. But when I add those two up, the dependence on A is going to cancel out, meaning no matter what about point you choose, the, the moment is the same. 
That's what's special about a couple. Okay. So, um, the total moment is equal to the moment produced by f and plus the moment produced by negative f, right? So how are we going to calculate that? The moment produced by f, we're just going to go through the definition. And that is the row vector for f crossed with the force. And that row vector we can write as p1 minus a. And then we're crossing that with f. OK, so that's just from the definition of a moment. And now we're going to add to that the moment produced by the force negative f. Um, and that is the row vector for that force, p2 minus a. And we're going to cross that with negative f. And cross product. Uh, you can, um, you can distribute the cross product as long as you keep the orders of everything the same. So I can write this as P1 cross F minus A cross F. And the second one I can write as P2 cross negative F uh, minus a cross negative f. And you can pull signs through the cross product. Uh, um, and so I can rewrite this as p1 cross f minus a cross f minus p2 cross f plus a cross f. And you can see that there's two terms that have A in it, and those two cancel each other out. And so in its simplest form, what you get is uh, the total moment is P1 minus P2 cross with f. OK. So for a couple, the moment is the same no matter what about point you choose. And this is a fully 3D uh, derivation. So uh, this is true in 2D true in 3D, OK? Um, and so, uh, so because of this, OK, so um, let's think of it in a table for a second. Uh, so our table says uh, row, force, moment. Um, and notice that, okay, so since the about point doesn't matter, the row vector doesn't matter. That row vector is just the location of the force minus the about point. So that doesn't matter. What about the net force of a moment, of a couple? Uh, well, it's equal and opposite forces. So that's always going to be zero. So this doesn't matter. That doesn't show up. And so all you have is just whatever that moment is, OK? So in the table, you're always just going to treat it like a moment and nothing else.
Okay. Um, so a couple, like for example, um, if you think of uh, what a screwdriver does, um, if you turn a screwdriver, like say you're tightening this screw, um, the edge of the screwdriver applies a force this way and the other edge applies a force this way. And then this, 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 how many do I have? This, this. And so um, when you turn a screwdriver, what you're doing is, um, is applying a kind of an infinite set of couples to this thing that don't pr produce any net force on that, but it produces essentially just a moment. So would you say that any like rotating shaft in any like piece of machinery right. is applying a couple? Yes, ex that's exactly right, yeah. Um, unless it just has a single point of contact on the outside or whatever, as long as that, as long as that uh, load is distributed over the whole area or over a whole length or something, yes. Uh, they, and, and we'll see that kind of stuff. And, and so when you see things like that, the way it's going to end up showing up in your table is just as whatever the moment is and nothing else. Okay, uh, the way we're going to represent it representation in free body diagrams. Um, in 2D, you can represent it like this. Or if it goes the other way, sometimes you'll see it represented like this. Uh, so if that moment is counterclockwise, you show it as a positive value. If it's clockwise, you show it as a negative value. So this would be positive and this would be negative. In 3D, uh, you would show it as, so remember a moment is, we talked about this a bit last time and people didn't like it, but uh, the direction of a moment vector, remember, is the thumb in the right hand rule. And so remember that a moment is always a vector and it's perpendicular to the direction of the rotation. And you show that as a vector in the direction of the moment, so like in the direction of the thumb, with two arrows like this. Okay. And so if you have multiple ones, that can be shown like this. And I think the two arrows are just indicating the two forces of a couple. You know, I think that's why somebody thought of that notation. But so if you see the double arrowheads like this, you know that that's a couple and not a force. Anyone have any questions or frustrations to vent before I go on to problems? Okay. It's unrelated to this. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, <laughs> this is not the right forum then. Okay. Uh, so it, Let's do a 2D example and then we'll do a 3D example. Um, so let's say we have an object. Um, the length is 1.5 meters. The height is 0.4 meters. Uh, let's say that this has a mass of 10 kilograms and uh, the bottom, going towards the bottom of the page is down, so the weight is acting towards the bottom of the page. And let's say that we have um, a force here and we don't know what it is. I'm gonna call this an unknown force vector R. 
And then uh, we have another force here at the middle of the bottom. Um, and let's say that it makes an angle of 70 degrees with the horizontal. And let's apply one more force to, I guess, uh, down here. Let's say there's a downward force of uh, 50 newtons. So we're going to use Newton's second law and the moment equation that says you add up all the moments and they're equal to zero. Uh, and I have to give this a name. Let's call this, uh, let's just call this F. So um, we're going to use Newton's second law and the moment equation rotational Newton second law to calculate this vector r and this unknown scalar f. So this is just about a free body diagram. Uh, we're, all we're missing here is the weight. So let me draw the complete free body diagram. We have this r up here. We have F here. We have the weight. I'm just moving that arrow up so uh, it's a little clearer to see. And uh, we have a mass of 10 kilograms, so this is 98.1 newtons. And then we have a 50 newton force here. That weight force always acts at the center of mass of the object. Uh, so far, we're just going to be doing rectangular and circular objects, so the center is pretty clear. Uh, pretty soon, we'll talk about how to calculate the center of mass in more complicated shapes. So is everyone good on this free body diagram? And now I'm going to write out the table. Uh, so rho, force, moment. Um, and so I'm going to start with this 50 Newton force. Uh, we have to choose an about point. I guess you can uh, simplify the math a little bit by choosing your about point where you have the most unknown forces. So I'm going to put my about point over here, the red dot. You can put it anywhere you want. In statics, in dynamics you can't, but in statics you can. Uh, so the 50 Newton force, um, the row vector, that's the vector that goes from the about point to where the force is applied. So that's going to be negative 1.5, negative 0.4. And then the fourth vector is 0, negative 50. To calculate the moment, the cross product is this times this minus this times this. So that's just positive 75. With me on that? Um, does it make sense intuitively that if this is the about point, this 50 would have a moment that's positive? Yeah, this, if this is the hinge, this force would make it rotate counterclockwise, and that's positive. And remember, even though I'm just for, to make the math a little quicker, I'm showing this as a single scalar value, a single numeric value, um, remember that that's actually a Z component. Okay, so uh, that's a positive Z component. Okay, let's go to the weight now. Um, the weight 
the rho vector is negative 0.75, negative 0.2. The force vector is 0, negative 98.1. Uh, to calculate the moment, it's this times this minus this times this. And you get positive 73.575. Yep. Is there any time that it would be valuable to not have the entire mass in the middle as represented as two unequal chunks? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, sometimes to do the calculations, um, so you can always think of, Any of these going to be, these are all from last semester. Okay, so say you have a shape like this. What state is that? Nebraska? Um, Idaho? Yeah, Idaho looks a little like that. So um, you could calculate where the centroid is of this. You can't yet, but we'll do that pretty soon. Okay. Um, or you could think of this as two separate masses where one acts here and one acts here, you know? If you know the, if you know the uh, relative sizes of these two pieces. And so, yeah, there, there are two ways you can represent the weight of this thing. One is to first calculate the centroid, which would probably be somewhere around uh, here, I suppose. And then the whole weight just acts at the middle like that. Or you could just break it up. Don't calculate the centroid. Think of it as two separate weights. Okay, what are we on? How about force now? The force F. Uh, so the row vector is the vector from A to where that force is applied. Um, that is negative 0.75, negative 0.4. And what are we going to call this force F? Well, we know the direction of it. So if we can come up with a unit vector in that direction, then we can just multiply it by F. Okay. Um, we are given that it's 70 degrees from the horizontal. So I'm going to draw out a coordinate system. Um, and I'm going to first draw a vector like this. And then second, I'm going to draw, okay, and to get to this one is 180 degrees, right? And then next, I'm going to draw the vector I want. And we can see that it's 70 degrees clockwise to get from the black vector that I drew to this blue one. And so the total theta is positive 180 minus 70, or 110 degrees. And so that force vector is uh, F times the cosine of 110, F times the sine of 110. And so cosine of 110 is negative 0.342. Well, yeah, and then the sine of 110, and this has to be multiplied by f, and then the sine of 110 is 0 0.940. So that's how we're going to represent that force vector. Uh, 
So negative 0.342F, positive 0.940F. Um, and so the cross product here is this times this minus this times this. This one is a little messier because um, everything has two components there. I'm going to use the cross product function on the calculator. So uh, negative 0.75 negative 0.4 crossed with negative 0.342 positive 0.940. And we have to remember that everything's multiplied by F. Some of your calculators can include variables, some can't. Uh, and so this comes out to be negative 0.842F. Okay, and then we have one more force. Uh, that is that force vector R. What's the vector from the about point to where that force is applied? Zero, that's right. The force is Rx, Ry. The cross product is obviously zero. And remember from the wrench example, when I was talking about sort of the intuitive understanding of a moment, I said, if you push down right over the top of the bolt, uh, no matter how hard you push, that moment is zero, and that's what's happening here. No matter how big that force R is, it can't produce a moment about that axis of rotation. Okay, so that's why we get zero there. So you chose that one because it had two components? Because it had two unknown force components there, and there's no point with more of more than that. And so, um, yeah. Any other questions about that table? So now all we have to do is add these up and set them equal to zero. That's Newton's second law for statics, and then we have to add these up and set them equals to zero. That's Newton's second law. Uh, that's the rotational Newton's second law for the static case. Okay, so Newton's second law for static equilibrium says zero, negative 50, plus zero, negative 98.1, plus negative 0 0.342F, positive 0.940F, plus Rx, Ry is equal to zeros. Uh, can we solve this yet with those two equations? No, because we have three variables and two equations. But now we're going to go to the rotational Newton second law for the static case. Um, and it says 75... plus 73.575 minus 0 0.842F is equal to zero. Now we have three equations and we have three variables, Rx, Ry, and F. So we should be able to solve this. Let's put it into reduced row echelon form and solve it that way. Um, so uh, our three equations are negative 0.342F plus Rx 
is equal to zero. The second equation is uh, 0.940F plus Ry is equal to positive 148.1. And our third equation says negative 0.842F is equal to negative uh, 148.575. You with me on just putting those equations together? And now we can go to make the augmented matrix. Uh, we have three equations, so three rows, four columns. There's always one more column than row. So this is equation one, two, three. Uh, we have to choose an order for the variables. I'll do F and then Rx, then Ry, and then the constant. Okay. Um, so for equation one, the Fs, we have negative 0.342. For Rx, we have one. Ry is zero and the constant is zero. For equation two, Fs, we have 0.940, Rx, zero, Ry, one, and then the constant is 148.1. And equation three, Fs, we have negative 0 0.842, uh, these are both zero, and the uh, constant is negative 148.575. Now time lapse, I got F is equal to 176.46 newtons. And this R vector uh, the X component is 60.35, and the Y component is negative 17.77. Any questions about that? Okay, now let's do one with a couple. Um, so let's say we have a beam and we have an unknown force vector over here. I'll call that R. Um, and the mass is five kilograms. And let's say we have a couple at this end of 25 Newton meters. Uh, let's make the length uh, 2.5 meters. And the height isn't going to come into it, but whatever, I'll give it. Um, so this is... 0.2 meters. Oh, uh, no. This should be, I'm sorry, this needs to be uh, unknown. So I'm just going to call this M. That's the unknown. And uh, let's give it another force to, uh, let's say there's an upward force of um, 100 newtons. Okay, so there it is.
Um, so start with a free body diagram. Uh, it's everything that's shown there. We have the R. Um, we have the couple on this side, M, the 100 Newton force here. And then we have a weight force in the middle of 5 times 9.81, so 49.05. Any questions about the free body diagram? Um, so now I'm going to fill out the table. We have to choose an about point. Any point you want can be the about point. It doesn't even have to physically on the, be on the body. You could make it half a mile above the body if you want, but it just makes the math a little messier, you know. Um, the way to make the math the cleanest is to put the about point uh, where you have the most unknown forces. But since we're using reduced row echelon form to solve these, it really doesn't matter too much. That makes it a little cleaner if you're going to solve this system of equations by hand. But eventually, we're going to get to things, too many equations, too many variables to solve by hand anyways. But I'm going to put the about point there. OK, so um, the first load is R. Um, what's the row vector for that force R? Zero, zero. Yep, it is 0, 0. The, you know, the row vector is the, the vector from the about point to where the force is applied. So just it's always 0 at the about point. <laughs> Uh, the force is R, X, R, Y, and so no moment. Then we have the weight force. Um, the vector from the about point to where that weight force is applied is 1.250. Zero. Um, the weight force is 0, negative 49.05. The cross product is this minus this. And so that is negative 61.3125. Next, I'll do the 100 Newton force. The vector from A to where that force is applied is 2.50. The force vector is 0, 100. The cross product is this minus this, so 250. And then last, we have that unknown uh, couple M. OK. Uh, the row vector doesn't matter. The force is 0, so I'm just going to skip worrying about those. And now uh, we know it has a magnitude of M. It's clockwise, which means it's negative. And so this is just going to show up as negative M. Any questions about that? OK, so Newton's second law. Add up all the forces and set them equal to 0. So we're just adding those up. Uh, so we have Rx, Ry, plus 0, negative 49.05. plus 0, positive 100 
is equal to zeros. This is a case where we actually could solve for Rx, Ry right from here, but I'm just going to wait and do it at the end anyways. Um, and then the moment equation, add all these up and set those equal to zero. So we have negative 61.3125. Plus 250 minus m is equal to zero. So the first equation says rx is equal to zero. The second equation says ry is equal to uh, negative 50.95. Does that look right? And the third equation, okay, I've kept too many digits to do that in my head. Um, says negative m is equal to uh, negative 188.688. What? Oh, I did. I forgot to write, write an 8. <laughs> well, luckily, it still works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's how I planned to do it. Um, okay, and so uh, this one obviously just says M is equal to 188 point whatever, 69. Newton meters, and this is Newton's. Uh, and so these two together say that R is 0, negative 50.95 Newtons. Any questions about that? Okay, so uh, these are both 2D problems. Um, In 2D statics, uh, you get two equations from Newton's second law. You get one equation for rotational Newton's second law for a total of three equations. So, you can't solve for more than three variables with three equations. So the most variables you can solve for is three. This is in 2D. Um, in 3D, we're going to be a, we're going to see that we can calculate six variables. Um, so what happens physically in a case like you got this beam, you have a weight, you have a joint over here that applies two forces, we'll call that R1, and you have a joint over here that applies two forces, call that R2. Uh, It's not hard to construct a thing that does this, but through statics, we can't calculate that. So is there something weird about those forces? Is there something indeterminate about that where the forces are switching back and forth? Like what's going on in a case like, like this? Um, 
The answer is you can't solve it by statics. It's called statically indeterminate. And you can't solve it by just using these statics equations. Um, to solve it, you need to also take into account um, the deformation properties. And so we're not going to do problems like that in this class. Uh, we're going to do that in D form next semester if you take that or whenever you take mechanics and materials D form. Um, okay. And now the last step that, I mean, we're done for today, but the last step that we have to take, we're going to do this on Friday is uh, if you're you know, working for an architect or whatever, and um, you have to do statics to see like what these loads are gonna be, how strong you have to make the, the um, joints and stuff like that, you don't ever get a problem in this form, okay? With all of the loads determined for you. So the last step, And we're going to do this next time, is problems don't occur with the loads determined, you know, with the loads all determined like we did today. Um, it shows up as joints. It shows up with joints. So a problem would appear something like this. Um, let's say you have a pin joint over here. And a pulley over here. And this is connected there. And then you have, uh, you know, something like that. And so the last step is we're going to have to know for each of these joint types, how do we represent that with unknown loads? So we need to determine, determine the types of loads applied to the body by each joint. Okay, so next time I'm just going to go through a list of all these different types of joints, and I'm going to tell you if you see that joint, uh, represent it with these loads. And it's just rules that you're just going to follow all the time. I mean, I'll try to explain, you know, try to give you intuition about why it's that way. But you don't even need to use that intuition if you just want to sort of memorize this stuff, you know. It's just you're going to see a pin joint, and that's going to be a pair of forces. And you're going to see a cable, and it's going to be a force in a known direction. And uh, so that's what we're going to do next time. And then at that point, we'll be able to do any 2D uh, statics problems. Question? Uh, yeah, so like A, I'm going to put it anywhere because like, because it's really intrastatic. Yes. So there's no like real adoption. That's kind of a way to think about it. So, well, the, the way, so um, the rotational Newton second law, when you go through the derivation, there are a bunch of terms that have velocities in them. Uh, if you, if you derive it for a general about point. And so... Um, those velocities go to zero if the thing is static. 
Okay, so that's why. I mean, uh, and you could do the full equation with all the velocities, but it's just not worth it. So instead, if you're in dynamics where those velocities would appear, you can see there's two choices of about point where, where those terms go away. And so in dynamics, it's just so much easier to just do your about point at the center of mass or at a fixed point. In statics, you can use this simple form anytime. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Okay, that's all. Oh, and the assignment for today, uh, it just, it's the same assignment as last time. I like, I just hadn't talked about some of that stuff yet. So if you haven't finished one and two that were due today, uh, you can finish those for Friday. If you have finished them, then you're off for the next couple of days. <laughs>